This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for this class, and this is Lecture 52, the second part of our two-part series on chemically amplified resist for lithography. Last time, we talked about the amplification reaction of a chemically amplified resist, or CAR. We came up with a very simple model for the CAR based on the assumption that the acid concentration, little h, is constant. It's not changing. After all, the acid acts as a catalyst, so it seems reasonable that the acid concentration will be constant. When that's true, we can generate the acid concentration. Well, in any case, we can always generate the acid concentration from this first order expression given a certain dose, I times T, and a rate constant C. We can determine the relative amount of acid generated upon exposure. But if this relative amount of acid stays constant during the post exposure bake, then we can derive the following expression for little m, the relative concentration of blocked or protected sites in the polymer. Little m represents the relative concentration of the dissolution inhibitor for development of that polymer. And we see that uh, using these relative concentrations, little h and little m, uh, that we can define a constant alpha sub f, which is called the amplification factor. It is the amplification rate constant times the PEB temperature. And the amplification rate constant is a normalized version of this rate constant of the PEB reaction itself. In this simple CAR model, we see a very uh, simple relationship between thermal dose and exposure dose. Give it exposure dose, we generate acid. Give it thermal dose, we make alpha sub F bigger. And this equation shows us the trade-off. More exposure dose gives us a larger value of H, so we need less thermal dose to get the same effect. If I use a lower dose, smaller H, I can give it more thermal dose in order to make up for the lower exposure dose. The result is a trade-off between exposure dose, which generates more acid, and thermal dose, which causes more amplification. Unfortunately, though, the assumption of locally constant concentration of acid is not right. It's not, it, it, it's not correct. It's not correct for two reasons. One is acid diffusion, and the second is acid loss. And for that reason, we're going to have to improve our model a little bit and understand this trade-off between uh, um, thermal and exposure dose in light of diffusion and acid loss mechanisms. So, diffusion. Diffusion will follow a very standard uh, diffusion. Fickian diffusion, we generally assume the diffusivity is constant, but that's not always true. The diffusivity of the acid uh, is d sub h, and in the 1D configuration, if we think about time and, and depth z, for example, uh, this is the 1D diffusion equation. Uh, in 3D, we can simply generalize the derivatives to be the derivatives with respect to all three dimensions. Sometimes we make the assumption of constant diffusivity of acid. We pull that out. Sometimes we uh, have a concentration dependence to our diffusivity. But what this means is if there is any time a concentration gradient in the acid, then the acid concentration will vary with time. And of course, there will be concentration gradients of the acid because that is our whole entire goal here. We are causing exposure in some regions and not in others. And as a result, there will be a boundary between those regions of high exposure and low exposure, high amounts of acid and low amounts of acids. And that gradient will drive diffusion. And so the acid concentrations will change with time. And we're going to have to deal with that to figure out the impact of the, the chemically amplified resist reaction. So if I only think about diffusion, uh, we can solve the diffusion equation in a very simple way. We say the concentration of acid as a function of position. Here I show one dimension for simplicity, but it could be two or three dimensions as well. The concentration of acid after the bake equals the concentration of acid before the bake convolved with the diffusion point spread function. What does that mean? What is a diffusion point spread function? It is very simply a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian that has uh, a sigma value equal to 
the diffusion length. And so taking the original distribution of acid, convolving it with the Gaussian that has a sigma equal to the diffusion length, gives me what the acid concentration looks like after the post-exposure bake. And this is a very common way of calculating the impact of diffusion on a concentration profile. If my initial concentration happened to be a delta function, that is all of my acid were piled up on one point, then I diffused. The convolution of the diffusion point spread function with the delta function gives us the diffusion point spread function back. In fact, that's how the diffusion point spread function gets its name. Uh, a, diffu a delta function, a point uh, concentration, will spread out to be the diffusion point spread function. So uh, point spreads uh, because of diffusion. So this is, in fact, the Gaussian function that we're interested in. But I don't have to think of it only in terms of delta functions diffusing. If I have uh, some latent image, latent image would be the name we give to H of X, the concentration of acid after exposure. So suppose this is the concentration of acid after exposure for some uh, line pattern that I've exposed into the resist. So this is concentration versus X, let's say. Then after diffusion, I will get a new concentration gradient that is smeared out compared to the old. Why? Because the concentration in the high, the acid in the high concentration region diffuses into the low concentration region and uh, we get a smeared out profile. So this is just a little review of diffusion and the concept of the diffusion point spread function. Again, it is a simple Gaussian uh, unit area um, Gaussian function with um, the diffusion length equal to the standard deviation of our Gaussian. Now, because of this diffusion, H is not going to be constant. Maybe globally there's a total amount of acid that's the same, but locally H is changing because of these gradients of concentration. So I'm going to define a new uh, term. I'll call it H effective. And it is very, it's a very simple concept. It looks fancy, but it's not. What is the time average concentration of acid? Pick a point inside the resist. Right? And at the beginning of the post-exposure bake, there's a certain amount of acid there. But over time, the acid concentration is changing because of diffusion. So I ask myself the simple question. What's the average over that bake time, the average concentration of acid? I'll call that H effective. So I take the concentration of acid. This is H convolved with the diffusion point spread function. Then I integrate that over time from 0 to the end of the bake time. And then I divide by 1 over the bake time to, to give a time averaged value to that. When the bake time is 0, uh, then I get this. Uh, I simply get the original uh, acid distribution back. But as I begin to diffuse, I look at the time average from the original distribution to the final distribution. So going back here, this might be the original acid distribution at the beginning of the bake. This is the distribution at the end of the bake where it's all smeared out. And what I want to know is what's the time average distribution from the beginning of the bake to the end of the bake. That's this H effective term. The deblocking reaction responds to the time average of the acid concentration. So I can take my simple model that I had before where I assumed H was constant and simply instead of where the acid concentration was, I substitute in the effective acid concentration. Now my simple model works just fine. I have to worry about this little uh, time averaging calculation to find the effective acid concentration. But once I've done that, I can now uh, convert an acid concentration into a blocked and deblocked polymer concentration. Well, this is reasonably straightforward, but I'm going to simplify it even more. I have, in fact, here two integrals. 
I'm integrating over time to find the time average, but the convolution itself is an integral. And it's an integral over space x. So I'm going to reverse the order of the integrals. Instead of doing the convolution first and the time average second, I'm going to do the time average first and the convolution second. When I do that, uh, I'll have a time average of the diffusion point spread function. This is the Gaussian function. It's got a standard deviation in it. Uh, and I'm going to average that over time from zero to bake time. I'll call that the reaction diffusion point spread function. This is something we can do analytically. For uh, a Gaussian in 1D, 2D, or 3D, I can calculate what the reaction diffusion point spread function is. Here it is in one dimension. Looks a little ugly, but eh, not so bad. Uh, I have two terms. First term is, in fact, just a Gaussian itself. Uh, two times a Gaussian, as a matter of fact. Second term has a complementary error function. We've already seen a complementary error function in some other diffusion calculations that we've done. So that shouldn't be too intimidating. And it's a function, the reaction diffusion point spread function, is a function of the diffusion length, sigma sub d. The diffusion length, sigma sub d, is simply, as we've seen before, the square root of 2 times the diffusivity of the acid times the bake time. And that's why there's a time dependence to the diffusion point spread function. Diffusion point spread function is a Gaussian with this standard deviation, and there is the bake time baked into the diffusion point spread function, if you pardon my pun. So when I integrate through time, this is where the time dependence comes from. OK, so in, here's a 1D case. There's 2D and 3D versions of the reaction diffusion point spread function. And uh, they look a little ugly, but they're not that bad, uh, especially if you program it up into a uh, software program or Excel or something to do the calculations for you. Now, uh, given the reaction diffusion point spread function, given any acid distribution initially, I simply convolve with that reaction diffusion point spread function to find out what my acid, the average, time average acid concentration is. Given the time average acid concentration, I can put it into my simple model and turn it into an exact model, a correct model, uh, for the amount of deprotection that will occur because of that bake. All right, that is the impact of diffusion. And what we have here is something called a reaction diffusion system, where things are both reacting and diffusing at the same time. Reaction diffusion systems are actually quite common. There's lots of applications for lots of processes where things are both diffusing and reacting at the same time. This is kind of a unique one because what's diffusing is a catalyst. So uh, oh, I just noticed I got my initials backwards here, RD, not SP, but PSF. This is supposed to be PSF. I just noticed that. I'll change it in the printed notes. Uh, it's correct down here. Reaction diffusion point spread function. Um, so reaction diffusion systems occur in lots of uh, uh, systems uh, besides lithography, besides photoresist. Uh, but this is a special case where the thing that's diffusing is a catalyst. But there's also other things going on, in particular mechanisms for acid loss. Our original assumption is the acid is not consumed, it's a c catalyst. And it is not consumed in the reaction itself, but there are side reactions that can cause the loss of the acid. So for example, uh, some of the acid might evaporate out of the top of the resist. That, this actually proved to be a problem for some resist systems. We solved it by making the acid a little more bulky so it doesn't evaporate very readily from the top of the resist. We can also have base contamination from the substrate. Some substrates, in particular nitrogen-containing substrates, uh, silicon nitride, tie nitride, uh, the nitrogen acts as a base. And when the acid diffuses down and touches the base, it gets trapped. Uh, it gets neutralized. And as a result, there's not enough uh, acid down at the bottom, and you get these uh, resist feeds, incomplete reactions occurring at the bottom of the resist. There could be some bulk acid loss. Um, sometimes the solvent, residual solvent, can trap the acid. Uh, 
Uh, but what proved to be the biggest problem, and we'll talk about it more in the next slide, is the diffusion of airborne base contaminants. Base contaminants from the air landing on the top of the resist and diffusing in. Sometimes we can purposely induce acid loss by adding a base quencher. Uh, and we'll also uh, talk about that in a couple of slides. But first, let's look at this diffusion of airborne base contaminants. This airborne base contamination problem occurs between exposure and post-exposure bait. So once you've baked the resist, then it doesn't really matter what happens to the acid when we're done with the bake. And of course, before you expose the resist, there is no acid to worry about. But in between the exposure and the post-exposure bake, this is where we can become susceptible to airborne base contamination. The base lands on the top of the resist, diffuses in, and neutralizes the acid only near the very top. Well, the very top is quite important because if the top of the resist doesn't have any acid, the top of the resist will not undergo any deprotection. If the top of the resist does not undergo any deprotection, then the top of the, res of the resist does not become soluble in developer. And if the top of the resist is not soluble in developer, it really makes no difference what happens anywhere else in the resist, because now development can't proceed. And this is what happens. Here's an example of some features. Uh, I'm happy to have friends at Semitech who provided me with these results many years ago. Here's some features where I had no delay between exposure and the post-exposure bake, and I got these nice, beautiful profiles. Uh, you see the aspect ratio is about 2 to 1, a little bit bigger. Nice looking profiles. But when I just let those features hang around for 10 minutes, uh, well, the smaller features didn't even print at all, but the bigger features printed just barely. And all it did was hang around for 10 minutes before I did the PEB. That was enough time for airborne-based contaminants to neutralize the acid. I have much, much lower levels of deprotection at the top, and therefore uh, poor development at the top of the resist. And I get these profiles that look like T, like a, a, the letter T. And so we call this phenomenon T-topping. And, uh, well, it's disastrous. If you have T-topping, it's game over. You can't make anything work. And in fact, some of the very early uses of chemical, chemically amplified resist were um, devastated by this atmospheric contamination problem. Uh, in fact, so much so that people were worried that we wouldn't be able to use these kinds of photoresists in manufacturing. And it was only through a very large-scale concerted effort by the industry, led by IBM, the developer of these resists, uh, were we able to overcome these problems. So what do we do to reduce T-tops? So that today we basically don't even worry about T-tops as long as we follow these steps. Well, we do a number of things. First of all, we reduce this post-exposure delay. Post-exposure delay is where we, we allow time for the base contaminant to cause the T-topping. So if we reduce that delay, we can eliminate it. Or, or at least reduce the amount of T-topping. How do we do that? We link the track that has the post-exposure bake hot plate directly to the stepper so that as soon as uh, a wafer is done exposing, it goes and gets baked. We can make sure that every wafer has a very consistent delay time so we get very consistent results. We still have the problem of, of if it takes, uh, say, 30 seconds to expose one wafer, then the first exposure field uh, is sitting around for 30 seconds longer than the last exposure field. So it's not perfect, but this improves things quite a bit. And this is, this is what drove the linking of the photoresist processing tracks with the steppers or the scanners uh, to produce a photocell. We can reduce the airborne base itself. This is an obvious thing to do. We go through the fab and we find all the sources of base contaminants and we try to eliminate them. But we can't eliminate them completely. Uh, so what we end up doing is putting air filtration on the track and the, the stepper or scanner. Uh, these are charcoal filters that are acid impregnated so that uh, we try to filter out any of the uh, base and all of our tracks are no longer and steppers and scanners no longer in the open air, but in self-enclosed uh, systems with this 
uh, filtration. And the last thing we do is we try to change the properties of the photoresist. In particular, we try to reduce the ability of base to diffuse into the resist. Try to lower the diffusion length of base. And we do that by modifying the, the, the properties of the photoresist uh, so that uh, we can bake it at a fairly high temperature and remove free volume from the polymer and uh, reduce the uh, diffusion length. We can also use a top coat. Again, it would be an acid impregnated coat on the top of the resist that would neutralize any airborne base contaminants that landed on it. We use this method as a stopgap method in the early days, but we don't like it because well, it's an extra layer that costs extra money. So in fact, all of these techniques are used today with the exception of that top coat. And by you performing all of these uh, steps to reduce T-topping, we've eliminated, essentially eliminated it as an issue in manufacturing today. Now there's one more area of, of uh, base, not really contamination, but base uh, neutralization of acid, where we're actually purposely adding base into the photoresist. Well, that might seem like an odd thing to do. Um, but in fact, uh, we'll, we'll see that it's very, very valuable, and in fact, incredibly valuable to add base to our photoresist formulation. Let's think about this. If I have a bottle of photoresist and I add base to it, now I also have a PAG, the photo acid generator, so that when I expose the resist, I generate acid. But the acid that gets generated will then neut be neutralized by the base. It seems like I'm wasting my time. But what I do is I put a little bit of base, but not as much as I have PAG. The result is when I expose and generate an acid distribution, say something like this. Here I'm exposing a space in the photoresist, and I have a lot of acid in the center of the space, and I don't have very much acid in the center of the lines. And I have this background um, concentration of a base quencher. This is a base that's going to neutralize any acid that it finds. Well, consider what happens when I combine these two. Uh, add the acid to the base. Well, you see that. In, in some regions, I have more base than acid. In those regions, all the acid's going to disappear. So the acid concentration will go to zero, and I'll have some distribution of base left. Then I'll have another region where the concentration of acid is higher than the base concentration. In that region, all the base is going to disappear, and my acid distribution is just going to be shifted down by the amount of, of base that I have. So what do I have left? I have an acid distribution that is zero until it hits a certain point and then it grows and then goes back to zero. And I have a base distribution that is zero in the region where I have a lot of acid but then has a, grows to a higher base level in the dark parts of the photoresist. There will be so-called neutral points, points at which the acid and the base have completely destroyed each other and there is no acid and no base at, at those points. Well, one of the key ideas of the base quencher is it helps to prevent a phenomenon that we do not like, which is the diffusion of acid from the exposed regions into the unexposed regions. Anytime we have diffusion, we're going to get a smearing out of this acid profile, just as we've seen. And diffusion is required for chemically amplified resist. For a chemically amplified resist to work, the acid must be able to move around to find new sites to deprotect. If the acid doesn't move around, then we don't get any amplification and no deprotection. So the acid must diffuse, but diffusion smears out the image. What can happen with the acid bases is, is we can get base diffusion to counteract the acid diffusion. Right? So suppose the acid diffuses. Well, it's going to diffuse from the exposed area into the unexposed area. At the same time, the base is going to diffuse across its concentration gradient. So the acid and the base will be diffusing in opposite directions from each other. If 
We control the diffusivity of acid and base just so, and these gradients just so, we can make these neutral points stay fixed. Or we can make them move to the right or move to the left, just how we want them to move. Well, this is a big advantage because now as the acid diffuses into the unexposed region, it's counteracted by the base diffusing in the opposite direction and we get no spreading out or smearing out or we get much reduced spreading out or smearing out of the acid distribution at the nominal line edge. Here we can see very explicitly the consequences of using this quencher. Uh, so in the red, Q0 is the initial concentration of quencher relative to the amount of PAG that I put into the photoresist. So Q0 equals zero means no quencher. And this is the acid distribution I get, uh, um, not the acid distribution rather, but the relative blocked polymer concentration. So this is M after the PEB. Now let's add some quencher. I'll add a quencher at, a, at an amount of 15% of the amount of PAG. So if I put in you know, 0.1 molar PAG, I'm going to put in 0.015 molar quencher. Now I look at the resulting distribution of blocked and deblocked groups at the end of that bake step and look at how much steeper those profiles are. Look at how much better we get. We have essentially no amount of deblocking uh, in, in the region where um, uh, it's nominally dark and I get a lot of deblocking in the region where it's nominally bright and a steep gradient in between. Notice that I have adjusted the dose to give the same acid level at the line edge. And this is important because one of the consequences of using quencher is I have to use a higher exposure dose. This is the downside of a quencher, quencher use. I have to give it more dose. I have to give it enough dose to overcome the amount of quencher I have in the exposed regions. And only after I've overcome that amount can I actually start generating an acid image. So I have to raise the dose when I add quencher, but if I adjust it so that I get the same amount of acid at the line edge, I'll get the same amount of deep protection, I will just get a steeper profile. Quencher has turned out to be one of the most important innovations in lithography in many, many years. Without quenchers, chemically amplified resist would be eh, maybe a little bit better than conventional DNQ Novolac resists. But with quencher, we find that these resists are much better than D and Q uh, Novolite resists. We get much higher performance and much better resolution out of these resists, all other things being equal. So very, very important, this idea of quenchers. All right, let's review what we've learned about chemically amplified resists in the last two lectures. Chemical amplification is a catalysis reaction. In this reaction, the acid, which is generated by exposure, diffuses around and catalyzes reactions with the polymer resin that deblocks or deprotects the polymer. That changes its solubility. It makes the polymer more soluble. Because the acid's not consumed, uh, that same acid could move around and cause multiple deblocking reactions. But that doesn't mean there are the acid concentration remains constant. There are two mechanisms for changing the acid concentration. One is acid loss. Acid loss mechanisms can reduce our ability to control the critical dimensions of our features. For example, if we have atmospheric based contamination. Or we can use acid loss mechanisms to improve CD control. For example, by the use of base quenchers. And finally, acid diffusion and its control is absolutely critical to the whole performance of chemically amplified resists, and in particular the, the relationship between acid diffusion and base diffusion is also very important. So what have we learned in lecture 52? You should be able to explain the concept of reaction diffusion. What is this thing called the diffusion point spread function? 
what is the reaction diffusion point spread function? What causes T topping in chemically amplified resists? And finally, why are base quenchers used in chemically amplified resists? Well, that is part two of our two part series on chemically amplified resists. Next time, we're going to start talking about development, the development of photoresists. Till then.